Boards and booze, booze and boards, drink some beers, fight some hordes, drank too much, forgot our swords, ran back home, filled our gourds, got drunk again, sang some chords, boards and booze, booze and boards, with Mickey and Jeb. Hey Mickey, guess what? What? You have nothing. No, <laughs> <laughs> don't tell them that, they don't know it. I was going to say, we have our third IDW game that they sent us mm -hmm. uh, to play. And what is it, Jeb? It is Torres. I think that's how you pronounce it. Torres? Tor uh, I don't Torres. think it's Torres. It would be, yeah, Torres. All right. I don't know. <laughs> anyway. Torres? Torres? <laughs> Torres or not Torres? <laughs> Whatever. All right, so uh, this is from IDW Games. Uh, Look, we're switched up. We're on different sides. <laughs> uh, I don't know what Hutch and Friends is. I guess that's like maybe somebody who worked on it before, or mm -hmm. it's uh, a brand within IDW. Could be uh, two to four players, sixty minutes, ages ten and up. Uh, we've got Wolfgang Kramer and Michael Kessling. I think. Torres. <laughs> Mickey's really quiet this episode. Uh, Torres is... Uh, when I first saw it, I think I compared it to... What was that? Santorini. Because it involves uh, like a grid of squares and you're building mm. up buildings and you got yep. people to move around. So it's similar to that. Except uh, this was way before that. Well, you know, the Santorini that we played is based it's on, on a an different older game, Santorini, right? so, so that I don't know. Been who, we actually, we, so we don't really know, yeah, we don't know who but, was first on the block. But, like Jeb said, it does have um, a similar look to yeah. it. Uh, probably, I mean, actually a little bit of a similar feel, too. So. Right. Uh, if you know Santorini, it's mostly like one-on-one. -on -one. Like, yeah. each player has one person. In this one, you're not really fighting other people. You're more of building and trying to figure out how to score the most yeah. points. There's no, there's no like one of like in San Arena, your one objective is to get to the top. Oh right, and right. this I about that. game is all about scoring points. So I would, I mean, um, the the building, you're a lot more focused on the building right. in in this game than would say the other game um like so there's kind of a different strategy to it mm -hmm. uh yeah so um it's pretty straightforward in, in terms of uh in, in terms of games um I don't, I don't have it's i don't have a whole ton to say until we start showing you what it's composed of because right. that's what it reminds me of it's a building type of game and um i guess the best way the, the best description for me would be it's an area control type of thing. So, yeah. Uh, even though other people can be in your area. Right. So, <laughs> that's kind of a, kind of a unique aspect about it, honestly. Right. Um, so, anyhow. Well, I guess, unless Jeb has anything else, I guess we'll dive right into components and all that type of thing so you guys can uh, take a look at this. Alright, All right. so we're here with uh, Torres, the components for the game, and as you can see on screen, that is the board that you're going to be playing on, so uh, you've got the, all, where all the pieces are going to be put, and Look, there's... Look, pretty on the back. <laughs> and around here is the uh, the score track, so that'd be pretty simple for what's on the board. Great. Uh, next up are the building blocks, and those get placed on the board. You get a rule book too. Oh, well, okay. So you get a rule book, and then there's also <laughs> that's uh, and, and a cheat sheet on what cards do. Cheat sheet. All right, and building blocks look like this. They're all the same. They look like lasagna. They do look like lasagna, <laughs> especially right. when you stack them and put them next to each other, and. Uh, they, they fit the squares nicely on the board. Yep. Then there are the night pawns, which each player is going to be using. There's four colors for the four different players. Night pawns. Uh, that's what they look like. 
They look like little bullet heads. <laughs> all right, uh, so all the players have their knight pawns. Then there is one king pawn. Dun, 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 the king pawn. And you can definitely tell that he's different because he's a lot taller. And he has a crown and, he, and he's red. Yeah. <laughs> all right. There are also the 100-200 tokens, which there's four of them for each yep. of the players. So that's just a, as an example, they're just a piece of cardboard, um, 100 on one side and then 200 on the other in case you lap the track. Um, stick that in front of you. Doesn't really fit. It doesn't really. It's not really conducive to yeah. like put it on the squares. So um, we played with putting it like keep it off to the side. Once you lapped, put it on where you were in, basically. Yeah, and at the very end of the game, I just threw mine under my pawn because it wasn't moving anymore. Right. Well, but that was just for me. So uh, next up are the action cards. So. Each player is going to have their own set of action cards, and they're all the same. Right. The only difference is the backs. I actually think uh, the pawn on the fronts are the color of the the card. They are, but yeah. they're still all the same. Yeah, I know. <laughs> if you want to see the other ones, you get blue and purple. Oh, they didn't see it. Oh, blue <laughs> and purple. All right. Okay, next up are the year cards. There's three of them for the three different amounts of players that can play the game, two, three, and four, and they list the information for how many you get, how many blocks you get for the year. Yeah, so basically as a diagram on what you get for each year, that'll make more sense when we go over gameplay, but you just look at the top, find the number of players, and that's the card you use. Three players on that one, and four player on that one. Alright, next up is the reference card. The one and only reference card. Why we get only one is beyond me, but that's all you get. <laughs> and that tells you everything you can do on your turn. And what's on the back? Is it the... Uh... The exact same thing. Oh, okay. okay. Right. Honestly, that was one of the... One of the things we didn't... Weren't too thrilled about is only having one. We do realize that you'll be able to memorize that pretty fast. But sometimes having an action card in front of you is kind of like... Oh, yeah, I forgot I could do that. Yeah. You know what I mean, sometimes? Anyway. Or if you're like me and you forget something and you don't want to be embarrassed, and you can just quickly look and be like... Eh, yeah, I remember how to do that. Yeah. yeah whatever. I got you. I got you. Okay, then there are the Master Cards, which these are used in a variant of the game, so you don't have to use them when you first play, but this is more for when you're used to the game. And they're like what secret scoring? Yeah, conditions. they're like they're like bonuses. So here's what they look like. So that probably doesn't make much sense, but basically they're telling you if you have these certain conditions, um, or if you had things in certain spots, whatever, that um, you'll get bonus at the end of the game. Yep. So you you can play without them. If you do, just put them back in. That's the how we're gonna play. So yeah. you're gonna you're not gonna see the um, the bonus cards or whatever what it, the master cards they call them sorry if, if you have questions about them and you're playing the game uh you can leave us a comment and we'll try to figure out the answer to your question but yeah like mickey said we're not going to play with them and that's everything for the components of Taurus. so next up is going to be setup yeah let's just jump right in jib all right we're back with setup weren't we fast yep <laughs> all right okay take it away jib first thing place the board in the middle of the table and I gotta say, I really like this board uh, because I I guess the easy thing would have been just to like make it a square board and normal. But this is kind of has like the tilt to it in the picture. But enough of that. Uh, next up, each player is gonna get seven knights and ten action cards of their color. Shit. What do we got out? So Jeb's got a stack of yellow over there, so we'll give him the yellows. And I have green already set up for a, a deck, even though you guys know that blue is my color. So I won't take it this time just because this little part that he's going to tell us to take next, unless he already did. You got the seven knights, the ten action cards, and then the bonus uh, yeah. 
or the the the, yeah. to the, the token, token that tracks your score. Right. Next up, everybody's going to place one of their knights on the score track at zero. Let's go put mine there. And then everybody is going to shuffle their cards and make a deck. Ooh. Shuffle, hey, shuffle, just shuffle. put that right in front of you. Yep. I'm just off to the, off the side, side, whatever. All right, next you are going to find the year card with the correct player count. So... In this example, we have two players. So we will be playing with three, though. Right. So but since this is two player, or the example's two player, Mickey grabbed the card that had the two people up top. Yep. And then what you are going to do, next you're going to make supply of blocks, place eight blocks on the board on the marked spots. So I'm going to move this off to the side for now. Uh, the eight spots are so the So simple. You can't mess this up. Oh, I can do my darndest. Uh, I'm sure you could. That was pretty easy. Alright, now you're going to use your year card to determine how many blocks players are going to get at the beginning of each year. Uh, you can place these in front of you like the card shows. And we kind of did it where we put all the blocks for each year in front of us. So, for this card, for the two-player game, year one, everybody's going to get four stacks of three. Year two is four stacks of three. Year three is four stacks of three. It's all the same for a two-player game. So, we're going to slide this out of the way for just a minute. Since you, Well, we keep the card kind of in view. So, this is what Jeb is going to get to start the game. And I'm going to get the same thing, but we're just not going to... Now, the important thing to remember in, the, in this is that each line represents a year. So, and you're only allowed to use one stack at a time. So, if you think you might grab from other stacks, especially in th those coming up years, you, you might want to distinctly, you know, move some of it back or off like to the side, or, or, or whatever. Because this reference card you can just lay right by the board, so it's not like you... I mean, you could almost just do... not even have them all in front of you. You could wait till the next year, yeah. and and then put it out if you really, really wanted to. I mean, it's right. not that bad. That's not that big of a deal. But More it, of your preference. If you right. find that you're making mistakes, then adjust it so that uh, you don't make mistakes. Exactly. So, um, just as an example, though, See, if we were playing, which we are going to, if we were playing with three people, that, notice the difference in, uh, in the stacks. First of all, these two reduce. And then the next year and then, is and then three, three, two, two, and then that's it. Right. And then the last year is three, three, two, and that's it. So notice, with the exception of, uh, in... You'll probably hear us say this again when we go through gameplay, but notice with the ex um, with two player, all the other games in year two and three only have three seasons, but with two players you have four seasons through the whole game. So right. just to, just something to note, um, and that's and that's it. It's like get the card and put in front of you what you're going to be using during the game. Okay, so once everybody has their stacks for the year, you are going to have the youngest player place a knight on any of the unoccupied castles on the board. So in this example, I'm the younger player, so I will take one of my knights, and I will put him on one of the castles. And then around the table going clockwise, everybody's going to do the same thing. All up in my business. Oh! <laughs> and then... It's because I've played this game now. Yeah. <laughs> and then once the last player has placed their knight, that player gets to take the king pawn and place it on any of the castles they want. All the way across the board. <sighs> it's going to be a rough game. <laughs> and I believe that is it. The younger player is going to be the one who starts the game. Alright, so an overview of gameplay is that the game is played over three years, which you've seen from the setup, the year card, and each of those years is divided into seasons. Uh, what happens is, 
for each season, the players are going to go around the table and they get their turns uh, to, to do whatever they want. So on a turn, you get five action points to spend. So if we start the game out, I'm the youngest player, so I would go first. And then for the first season, I would take my turn to spend five action points. So we should probably tell you what you can do with action points, right? Oh, I'd be glad to, Jim. All right. Okay, using my handy-dandy action card, <laughs> for two action points, I can place one of my knights, adhering to the knight placement rules. Okay, so first we should say the rules for placing a knight is they must be adjacent, orthogonally, not diagonally. Yep, so there's no diagonal in this game. I'll place my knight there. That cost me two action points to do that. Okay, so pretty easy. So a bunch of questions that you might have as the game goes along. Now I know this isn't a legal tower, but just so you know, this is still adjacent. It's a legal placement. It doesn't have to be the same level, just has to be adjacent, okay? So, adjacent is adjacent no matter how high. The rule the is thing. it has to be equal to or lower than. So the guy on the ground couldn't place it, the one at the very okay. top. Okay, I, I did know that, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah I was that just was, clearing that, that up. Was, for yeah, you, you're right, that was per, poorly worded. You can't, because you're going to score points based on, ba based on the height. So if you were allowed to just jump into the game super high, that would be... That would be um, not good. Right. So, yes, I'm glad that Jeb uh, you know, clarified my s stupid wording. <laughs> we should probably tell them what levels are. Yep. So, right now, the knight on the board itself is at level zero because right. he's not on anything. All the other knights and the kings are on level one because there is one block under them. Right. So, every block in a stack is going to be how you a determine level. the level. Right. Okay. So, uh, uh, and you cannot place a knight in an occupied spot. Oh, right, yeah. That you, is you, another key thing. Right. And occupied means another pawn, not a building. Right. So two pawns can never be in the same spot. Right. That's one of the rules. Okay, and so that is the only action that you will take that costs two action points. And there's nothing that goes above two. So if you can remember that placing a knight is the only thing that costs you two, you're way ahead of the game. Because yeah. pretty much uh, everything else is going to be one except for a zero action. Okay, so the next thing you can do is you can move your knight one space. And again, orthogonally only. And, you know, if you want to use all five action points to run around the board, you're more than welcome to do it. Um... One space also equals going up one level. So if I wanted to go up here, that would just be one right. action point. I mean, you're still only moving a space. Like if this was right. two, you'd be going up. But just so that you know, there's no uh, no extra movement for being able to go up. Uh, you can only move up one level at a time, though. You can't skip levels. So what Mickey's saying is if that was the case... If I spend an action point, I could move up one level. Right. If this right. was the case, I no can't. go. Two, two cannot go. cannot jump up an extra level. Okay, so that's moving a knight. If I'm up there and I want to hop down, I can hop down as many that's levels as I want. That's correct. For one action point. Yep. <laughs> Okay, one action point. You may place one castle building block. A maximum of three blocks for, per turn. Um, that's kind of important because if you remember the setup, you've got rows of three in, in front of you. There's four rows of three in front of me for this year. At, during this turn, I am supposed to pick one of those, and that's the only stack I can pull from this round. When, when you choose to place a building, you pick from one of your stacks, like Jeb said, and then you can place it um, adjacent, I guess is the best word, again, uh, you know, no diagonals, 
by any kingdom that you want. Now, what constitutes a kingdom? Well, right now, everything on the board is its own kingdom. Castle kingdom. Ca it, I thought, I thought oh, they were actually... I think they're called oh, kingdoms. Oh, okay. okay. Maybe it is castle. Doesn't really matter, but so, like, I could place here. Just know there's eight of them there, to start with. Right. I could place there, or I could place here, etc., etc. I can't them. place there. Right. All right. You're not allowed to start a new castle right. kingdom or whatever. Uh, I can place there. Except for the rule of levels. But yes, you can right. place on top of stuff. I can place on top of stuff. You cannot place on top of people. And not on top of people. Okay, so let's get into the intricacies of the rules on, on, on placing stuff. Jeb already mentioned one. So as you start to place stuff, one of the key things to remember in your... Now it's going to bug me if it's really supposed to be kingdom or castle. Alright, so now that I have the terminology and it won't bug me anymore, <laughs> we're building castles. Alright, and we're talking about um, placement. So if I place one here, this castle now has a base of two. Yep. How many levels you can build up depends on the size of the base. So now that I have a level, uh, or a base 2 castle, I can go up to level 2 in terms of placing. Yep. In order to get to 3, it would have to at least have another piece on somewhere base. Yep. on the base. Oh, now it's a 3. It can go up again. Notice that I didn't have to have one of my knights around me or anything else. Why I would want to do that in the middle of nowhere right. is, you know, maybe I have a strategy or a superpower card. Who knows? But the key here is to remember that level of the castle can only be as high as the base of the castle. All right? Also, when placing... All right. Let's say that that castle exists now. I am not allowed to place on this castle. Okay? Or this castle for that matter. Because, because it's merged a castle. It's combined two separate castles. This, this guy is his own castle to start with. Now I can go down this way. And this now it's a four base. But if somebody starts building off of... Uh, here, they're messing up anything, that, any chance that I have to go that way. Yep. Hopefully that's making sense. So, the key is you can't merge castles. Right. There's always going to be eight different castles on right. the board. You cannot, yeah, if there's not eight, somebody plays something wrong. Yeah, because you're not allowed to add right. a random castle out here. Like, right. That would make nine on the board, which you can't have. So, um, did I miss anything on key points on placing? You cannot be occupied, and you can't have a level that is higher than the base. Those right. are the keys. And, and, and you can't create, uh, you can't merge castles or create new ones. Right, and and also, I, I know it says it on the card, but you're the maximum of three per turn. Right. It's kind of, um, it's a nice reminder in terms of in case you grabbed too many. Like if you grabbed from uh, multiple stacks by accident, you could catch yourself by like, wait a second, I can't place three but the in front of you the maximum height of your supply is three anyways so just remember that once you start pulling off of one stack that's the only one you can pull off of all right and then one quick thing we should talk about is if we have if you don't mind putting that three stack next to that so say on mickey's turn he chooses the far left stack to pull from and other, sorry, my left. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he decides to place two blocks on the board from that stack. And then he spends his other action points on whatever he wants, and his turn's over. So he has that one building, or yeah, that one. This one is piece. left over that I it's didn't left use. over, right. So he is actually able to redistribute those to the other the other stacks for that year as long as it doesn't exceed three. So he could place it on that stack, he could place it on the other stack. But not 
right. on that because it goes up to now if they exceeded the three limit. Right. And if you're not able to place it on any of the other stacks for that year, they get tossed into the supply. So, what Jeb is saying is that if that is my picture, or my supply, and I only use two on my turn, and this is sitting here, I have no ability to redistribute, whoop, back in the box. Yep. I, I know Je you guys are looking at it from here. Like, this way, I'm looking at it backwards. Yeah. Another important thing, though, Jeb did go left to right. When you choose, I think I already said this, but I'm going to say it again. When you choose which stack you want to choose the, to use, I, you can start right from the middle if you want. Just remember yeah. that this is the stack that you used. So, like, in the case where these are the three seasons Mickey can pull from, he can choose to pull from the three stack, or he could pull from the two stacks. It's whatever right. he wants to So, do. let's say... So strategically, let's say I only needed to place one. I place one, do other stuff on my turn, and then look, now the next two turns I have maybe the ability to place three buildings because I needed to do other stuff that turn. Yep. So, one action point, you may buy one action card with a maximum of two times per turn. So they're not going to let you get your whole, whole deck that fast. Right. And when you decide to buy an action card, what you do is draw the top three cards so from that, your deck. Those are the decks that everybody got at the beginning of the game. So I draw three. You get to look at them and keep one of them. Look, 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 and I like this one. Oh, All plus right. I get to take seven actions on my turn instead. I put it secretly face down in front of me, and then these two which is one of the things I thought was kind of nifty about this game. And they don't get discarded, and they don't have to go underneath. They actually can be put back on your deck any way you want. Uh, not, not any way. They can either be put on the top or the bottom in any order or any combination that you want. So I think you can mix as well. You can put it right in the middle? Oh, no, no. I thought you meant one on the top, one on the bottom. That's what I think I said that. Oh, okay. I, but my, it's, yeah. you know, my, my point is, like, I could take one of these, put it on top, one of these, put it on the bottom. Or two on top, two or bottom. Two on, maybe they're both really good, but I want this one first, put this one on the top, and the next one underneath. Yeah. They both are not anything that I'm going to be using anytime soon. Boom, put them both on the bottom and try to cycle through that power that I need to get. So then if I, if I have another action point left on my turn and I want to start building my hand like I said I can at least do it one more time yep. I'll look again pick a nifty card secretly put it down there put these back in any uh, any order and uh, placed on the top or the bottom and yes you can split them up doesn't matter alright uh, one key thing about this is you cannot use the card that you bought this turn so Mickey got those two cards, but they have to stay face down in front of him until his end of the turn, he can put them in his hand. Right. And then there is no hand limit, but there is a deck limit. And what that means is once cards are discarded, you are not getting them back. Right. So, so when you, your deck runs out, right. you're done. You never recycle powers in this game. It's a one-shot type of thing. And no, there are no cards that get cards out of your discard pile. Right. So it's a one and done. The next action you can take for zero action points is actually to play one of these cards, assuming that it, it's uh, in, your hand. It, in your hand, which, um, like Jeb said, it needs to you know, get back to your turn, so to speak. And the key is, they're free to play. Right. So it's a zero action point, so you could, uh, you know, whatever you needed to do, it's, it's like, it's, it's, it, there's good stuff. And then once you resolve the effect, you just put it in your discard, and it's never coming back. Right. And at a zero cost, there is no limit to what you could play either. You could store up and go ham on a turn if you wanted to. Yep. Okay, and then the last action that you can take for one action point is moving your knight one space up the scoring track. Another thing that I found a little interesting... Um, about this game because sometimes you get to the point where it's like you know I, there's really nothing I want to do or need right. to do or whatever and they still give you an option yeah. and there's a couple neat things 
about this. One, you're, you're just buying a victory point. Two, if I'm standing on the one and Jeb decides to do the same thing on his turn and he buys a victory point, he goes to one also. However, you're never allowed to have two knights on the same spot on the victory track, so Jeb gets to bounce I over me. I get a free me. victory point. Right. So think about that with four players. Yeah. <laughs> so next This turn, guy doesn't, on. doesn't, it has a, he wants to be like, well, huh, for one action point, I can get three. Yep. Number four is like, well, I can outdo that. I'm going to take one action point and move to there. So, uh, and it's, it's really kind of a neat mechanic, especially when this game gets going because, you know, the points start to fly. It starts to get a little bit close. Um, these things could make a big difference. And there is no need for tiebreakers. Right, exactly. <laughs> And I believe that <coughs> all the actions you can take on your turn, so like we said, five action points, you can spend them doing any of those things any way you want to do them. What would happen is for each season, it goes around the table, all the players get a turn, and then at the very last season of the year, you're going to do your end of year scoring. Okay, so remember, when Jeb's talking about a season, it's the four stacks so you should have like it would be I go then Mickey goes I go then Mickey goes right. I go Mickey goes I right. go Mickey goes your one's done right so if you're ever looking at like if you've already gone and you're looking over at, at your opponent and you still have the same number of towers as he has and you've already gone you did something wrong yeah <laughs> so that's all I'm trying to get at is uh, Make sure that you chuck any towers that you didn't use and or uh, redistribute how, you know, just make sure your towers are right. And then once you, everybody is run out or done with their last turn, then like Jeb said, you're going to score. Another thing that I find uh, cool about the game is that the intermittent scoring, other games do it, this isn't unique, but I like that. It's kind of mm -hmm. cool. Um, then everybody kind of knows like, what, they need oh, to do. what do I need to do, or, you know, can, can I mess with this, or whatever. So, anyways. Alright, so, let's talk about the scoring that happens at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. So, the first thing, for the first year, you're going to do one castle at a time, scoring in turn order. So, in this case, I was first, so I would score all the castles that I was in. And then Mickey would score all the castles he's in. Okay. And so. what is what does Jeb mean by the castles that you're in? Yep. All right. So let's uh, let's just put some stuff on the board. Fast forward. This is what it looks like at the year, end of year one. We just made crap up. We have no idea if that's the appropriate yeah. number. <laughs> it certainly could probably happen. I don't think we went overboard on the things, but this is we just want to give you an example of scoring. All right. So the way scoring works is. It is, you look at a castle, you look at your knight who is on the highest level, and then you multiply its level by the base of the castle. And then that's the amount of points that you gain from that castle. So, we'll go through this really quick. Uh, let's start with me. Since I was first player, I score first. So, there's eight castles. Oh, look at that. I only have guys in one castle. Man, I did really good. Yeah, you did. <laughs> so, I would look at this castle, and I have a knight on the second level and a knight on the first level. So, you only score one knight in each castle, so I have to choose the one that's higher. So, the guy on level two is the one that I'm going to use for scoring. He's level two. The base of the castle is four, so two times four is eight. So, I get eight points for that castle. And Mickey is moving me up eight. Then I look at all the other castles. I've got no knights anywhere. So Nada. that's all I'm getting this year. So right. once I'm done scoring, Mickey's going to score. Right. So I will start at the same castle as Jeb. Yes. Uh, it, it doesn't matter how many knights of any color are in there. If you have a knight on the castle, you score the castle. So I am also at level two. And again... To reiterate, Jeb said that base is four. Two times four is eight. Oh. So I get 
eight. And I, I have, I, I guess that would strategically how you score yourself that makes is. a difference yep. because if I would have ca calculated a different castle first, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have landed on eight, and then whoop, you get can't land point. it. I get a free point. Yep. All right. And that's it for that castle. Yeah. So. And I go on to this castle. I'm at level one. The base is one, two, three. So I get three points. Three times one is three. And then over on this marvelous castle. <laughs> We have a base of three, one, two, three, and look at that, I made it up to the third level also. So three times three, three up, three base is nine. So I got my 12, so I go all the way to 21. And, and one last castle. One last castle. I am level on one. A level one with two, and one, two. I think I played wrong. Yeah, you did. <laughs> But, right. oh, Jeb, what about the king? Oh, yeah, everybody's like, what's he doing just sitting around? No, there is actually a bonus based on the king after everybody scores their knights in the castles. So, since Mickey and I are done scoring our knights, we're going to look at the king bonus. So, the king bonus is only for knights in the king's castle, so Woo! I, I don't even get to think about it because I don't have a guy over there. But, for year one... The way you would score it is in year one, your knight has to be on level one, one of, of the, the king's, king's castle. castle. So and this is the end of year one. Mickey, his knight is on level one inside the king's castle, so he gets the bonus, which happens to be five points. I'm running away with this. Yeah. In year two, your knight has to be on level two of the king's castle. Year three is level three of the king's castle. Okay. Okay. Now, it's important to note exactly what Jeb said there. It matters where your knight is, not where the king right. is. So in year two, if nothing else changed except for this, I get the bonus. Yep. I'm at level two in the king's castle. At the end of year two. At the end of year two. It makes no difference what level the king is on. It only matters what year it is and what level your knight is standing on within the king's castle. The king is there to pretty to, much block a spot and to tell you what which castle, castle is, is the king's. Yep. So uh, that's a easy thing to like get confused in your head. Yeah. It's like. Oh, year three, level three, how do I get the king up? Well, once you realize that nobody moves the king except at the end of a round. <laughs> right. And then, if that was the case at the end of year one, Mickey only gets the bonus for one of his knights. He doesn't get multiple king bonuses. And if you're curious, at the end of year one, the king bonus is five points. End of year two is ten points. End of year three is fifteen points. So it gradually increases as the game goes on. Yep. All right. And then once the king bonus is scored, somebody gets to move the king. And that depends on the player who has the lowest score. They get to move the king to any other castle. So look at that. I'm lowest, so I guess I'll move him over there. So, he's already set us both up to get yeah. the bonus. That was nice of you. Yep. Thanks, man. If I wanted to, I could put him over here and make Mickey work a little bit, but... Actually, that's not a bad idea, putting it where he did, because yeah, he's in a better position to mess with building that castle up than I am, and that king just blocks the space, so... Yeah. I mean, not not that I... Because I, I, I can't place anything or here or here. He actually can place over in that corner. Yeah. I know I'm getting into strategy, but it's not it's not as silly as it looks, really. All right. Okay, and then once the king is moved, the year is over, and the next one begins. And the key here is the player with the fewest points gets to go first. So, once again, uh, I am lowest score right now, so I would be first player in year two. And then, the way the game works, there's only three years, so after the third year... Whoever has the most points is the winner. Right. And remember, in year two, you would have this. You would be using whatever right. in year two on the diagram is, which will be different for uh, three players and four players. Um, the only other thing is, after the initial 
scoring. Scoring starts with the person in the lead or the person in... The Score heart. in order of person with the most points first. Right. So after that initial player order... So year let, one is scoring player order. Right. So then year two and three is whoever's in the lead scores first, which is actually a, a little bit helpful in terms of that hopping mechanism right. to let them get out a little bit farther, um, if assuming that they s scored enough. And believe me, that does not mean you scored enough. Right. Because there is all kinds of lead changes in this game, or at least there seem to be. And that's pretty much everything for how to play a regular game of Torres. Uh, the only other difference is if you use the Master Cards, and those, everybody's going to get a random card, and that's going to be your secret Yeah, it's your secret, secret mission. Yeah, and if you can pull it off, you get bonus points at the end of the game. I think that's everything. So we are going to have Will join yep. us for a three-player game of Torres. You guys can check it out to see uh, how the game actually plays. Just give it a few minutes. If you think that's enough, go for it. If you want to see what happens at the end, it's a dramatic conclusion. I it guess. is. Uh, you can watch that. And then we'll have the review after that. So. All right.